Hi folks. Well, today we're going to continue on in our sixth message in a series called Time with Jesus. So the disciples have been with Jesus for a while now, over three years, and their journey with Jesus had truly been life-changing. Jesus knew that something was coming that would hit these disciples really, really hard. And so he knew that he would soon endure terrible torture and pain. He knew this because he'd been sent by his Father to do so. The day was quickly approaching, and Jesus knew what lay ahead. The shadow of the cross was looming in his mind, and so Jesus turned his time and attention to his those that had been with him these past several years. He told them that his time was coming once again, but they did not fully understand what he was talking about. As only a loving Savior could do, he turned his attention to his disciples in those final moments. This would be the time for him to share some of those intimate moments of teaching with a small group of men. In the first message entitled, The Humble Servant, we looked at a, the lesson Jesus taught these men when he shocked them by washing their feet. As they were still reeling from that le lesson, Jesus would surprise them again with what he said next. In the me second message entitled, Is It Me? Jesus revealed that one of them would betray him. He knew and had already revealed this earlier, just as he revealed he'd die on the cross, but it didn't really sink in with his disciples. Once again, Jesus would talk about being betrayed. They may have ignored his words earlier, but for some reason, this time, it, they heard it differently. Maybe it was a look on his face as he spoke the words, but this, this time they were trying to understand what Jesus meant. One of, the, one of them would betray Jesus, whom they all loved and had followed all these past several years. Who would betray Jesus? Jesus knew that it was going to be Judas and had provided a, even a clue that that, that that would be him. But even as, G, as Judas walked out into the darkness of night, the disciples were still not sure which one of them would betray him. The third message entitled, It Won't Be Me, Jesus continued to teach this small group of men. He spoke about doing everything for the glory of God, his Father, and how his sacrifice and resurrection, something that he would endure alone because he loves us, would bring glory to God. And Jesus, we, we learned from Jesus that we should do everything for the glory of God. And Jesus stressed the importance of loving each other as he loves us. Still concerned about the betrayal, though, Jesus, uh, Peter declared his allegiance to Jesus with the best of intentions. But Jesus looked straight into Peter's heart and knew that there was still room for sin there. And Jesus told an overconfident Peter that soon he would betray him, not just once, but three times in a short period of time. We learned that we too are called to be faithful and not just to pretend that we are, but to live out our faithfulness with all of our heart to be genuine in our walk with Jesus. We learn that we need to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, keeping our heart faithful and resisting the temptation of sin. In our fourth message, entitled Knowing the Way, Jesus continued this time of teaching, and he told his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled, to set their hearts at ease and ex ex so that they could experience peace in their lives. Jesus told them to have faith in him and to trust him with a mountain move, with a mountain moving type of faith. Jesus revealed that a place had been prepared for all of us in heaven and there is still room for all who would believe. Finally, Jesus reminded them and us that he is the only way to get there and that we must believe that he is God's son and that he has paid the price with his precious blood. Last week in the fifth message entitled, you are not alone. Jesus focused on the following. He said, If you love me, keep my commands. And as a believer, we are not alone. The Holy Spirit lives in us forever. The Holy Spirit will guide us, remind us of what Jesus said, and comfort us in our times of trouble. When that we will be reunited with Jesus when he returns, when we see him in heaven, where we will live with him for eternity. And finally, Jesus gives us real peace, a peace that comforts our soul. So this brings us to today's uh, 
message entitled The Connection, and we're going to move in now to John chapter 15. Once again, let's take a seat with those that are gathered there with Jesus around him and listen to what he has to say. And Jesus would use an illustration about something that they were all very, very familiar with to show how our relationship with him should be. We will go through the entire passage once and then circle back to take a closer look at what Jesus meant when he said when he taught said these things to the folks gathered around him. So grab a seat with his disciples and let's let's listen to his words in John chapter fifteen. Begin with verse one. I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While <clears throat> he cuts every he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. Uh, and the uh, and so that it he so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call, call you servants because a servant does, does not know his father's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you might also bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. And so the first point here is always stay connected to Jesus. As believers, Jesus should be at the center of all that we do. Without him, with, with, with Christ, we cannot truthfully call ourselves Christians. Right? Without him, without Christ, we cannot truly call ourselves Christians. It is only through him that we have salvation and eternal life. These past several weeks, we have seen a hurricane, hurricanes plow their ways through the southeastern portion of the United States. We saw terrible flooding and the loss of human life. Life for the people in the path of the storms was dramatically changed from what they were before. People who had gone about their daily business had their routines severely altered. One of the things that affected millions of people was the hurricane force winds that blew down trees and power lines. Cities that had, were, that had once been brightly lit were now in total darkness. They had become disconnected from their power source as those power lines broke under the stress of the hurricane. Just like the power lines that need to be connected to the power source, we, as Christians, must stay connected 
to Jesus. Jesus used the illustration of the vine and the branches to show us this. A branch cannot survive without being connected to the source of its nutrients and life. The vine supplies everything the branch needs to live. So, it is our power, our source of, our source of life. John chapter 15 verse 6 in this passage today. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branch branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. When we are not connected to Jesus, we have no life. Jesus is life. Look at the very first verses of the book of John, the same book that we're studying today. John chapter 1, begin with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. It all begins and ends with Jesus. Without Him there would be nothing. But is Jesus really our source of life? Look at what the next verse says. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, without Jesus, there is no life. Without Jesus, there is only death. Jesus is the source of the fruit. Without Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. Look at what he says in this passage in verse 4. Remain in me and I also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. No Jesus, no fruit. Without Jesus, there is a big zero in our life. Without him, we can do nothing. How important is this fruit? What can it accomplish? Jesus tells us this in verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. We bear fruit for the glory of our Heavenly Father, not for personal gain or self-praise. Fruit is the, our, is the evidence of our walk with Jesus. People see the fruit and they know that we belong to our Heavenly Father and that we also belong to Jesus. Our fruit becomes like a name tag to others. Hello. I'm a follower of Jesus. If we bear good fruit, should we take credit for it? What does Jesus say? Verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Jesus tells us that he picked us to be who we are. He fashioned us for a specific purpose to bear fruit. It may be easy to be proud when others recognize your fruit, but keep in mind that the fruit is produced for him under his direction. He is the true source of fruit. He is also the source of power. Like we said before, our power comes from being connected to Jesus and His Father. When we stay in a close relationship with Him, His power flows to us. In the center of His will, we do an in the center of His will, something extraordinary happens. Look at what Jesus says in verse seven: "If you remain in Me and My words remain in you, ask whatever you wish." and it will be done for you. Still not convinced? Remember, if Jesus repeats something, it must be important. So look what he says in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, 
And so the, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. There you go again, right? Connected to Jesus, we experience his power in our lives. Jesus is also the source of love. Remember what I said, that Jesus repeats things that are important so that we will remember. Well, the one thing that we find Jesus talking about again and again is love. It seems, it seems like it always comes back to love. True love comes from the Father through His Son to us. Jesus will focus again on love in the passage today. Look what he says, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. John would remember this later on in 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but he, he loved us and sent his son as a atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. No one who fears, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. By staying connected to Jesus, we experience this love firsthand. And Jesus is also the source of our salvation. Verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay his life down for one's friends. Jesus' mission was to bring salvation to the world. He would endure the cross to do that. Why would he do that? Because he loves us that much. We only have salvation through our connection with Jesus. Acts 4, beginning with verse 11. Jesus is the stone of you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So He is our salvation. 
He is also the source of our friendship. Friends are wonderful people to have in our lives. There's a big difference between an acquaintance and a friend. If you're looking for a model friend, look no further than Jesus. He is our perfect friend. Not convinced? Listen to what he says in beginning in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay one's life down for one's friends. That would be Jesus, right? And Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. But then he says what? Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. And you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The old hymn says it well. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus himself told us that greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And he did that for you, my friend. By staying connected to Jesus, we get to experience the perfect friendship from a Savior who has given his all for us. But being the branches does not just depend on our relationship with Jesus the Son. Our Heavenly Father has an important role as well. Jesus calls him the gardener. We are in the hands of the gardener. I have been to one of those cities before in North Carolina that was recently flooded by the hurricane a couple of weeks ago. Nestled in the western North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains is the city of Asheville. Growing up in East Tennessee, we would drive east through the mountains until we arrived there. One of my favorite places to visit was the Biltmore Estate. On, on the estate is a castle, Biltmore Castle or Biltmore House, built by George Washington Vanderbilt II between 1889 and 1895. It is the largest privately owned house in the United States. But as grand and as opulent as the castle is, I always enjoyed touring the gardens there. Biltmore's 8,000 acres are, comp are comprised of six formal and informal gardens, a conservatory and natural trails connecting them to the French Broad River and the estate's deer, park, lagoon, farmland, and woodlands. As someone who loves plants, those gardens have always had a special place in my heart. Everywhere you look, there is beauty there. In the Rose Garden alone, there are over 250 variety of roses. But what you quickly realize as you look around at those gardens is that there is an army of gardeners and caretakers that keep everything in pristine and beautiful condition. Without the gardeners, the flowers would not be as beautiful and as healthy as they are. Jesus reminds us that we have a gardener as well. Not just any gardener, but the best gardener. A gardener that created the entire world that we live in. Who best to take care of everything than the Creator Himself? Jesus tells us about His Father in this passage as well. Look at what He says in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And the Greek word for he prunes is also he cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. It is God the Father 
that prunes or cleans us. God looks at the area of our lives that are diseased by sin and cuts them away. Cutting is painful at the time, but necessary. He cuts away those areas out of our lives that damage us and make us less fruitful. Sin spreads like wildfire, and it's best to get rid of the disease before it does even more damage than it already has. Jesus illuminates those sinful areas of our lives so that they can be disposed of. Like I said, I love roses. But roses can start to grow in directions that you do not want them to go. They are not healthy. That's not healthy for them. Sometimes they must be trimmed to change their direction and their growth. When we disagree with God's will for our lives and go in our own direction, God sometimes prunes us to get our lives back on track and into His will for our lives. Pruning us push, pushes our focus into being more fruitful and more like Jesus. Remember, maybe you can remember a time when, when, the, when God had pruned you. It really hurt at the time, probably. But after the pruning, your life changed for the better for Him. Verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be, his, to, to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my Father's name, in the name of my Father, in my name, the Father will give you. A good gardener looks closely at the plant to see what it needs. A yellowing plant may need some iron or some minerals. A drooping plant may need some water. In a sense, the plant is communicating with the gardener, and the gardener, and the gardener sees its needs. God, the gardener, loves us and wants us to thrive in His will. He listens to us and gives us what we need to be healthy in our walk. At our best and most abundant point, we only ask for His will to be done in our lives and that we bear even more fruit for Him. Our desire is to make our Heavenly Father proud of us by doing His will and embracing the painful pruning as a means to get there. So folks, always stay connected to Jesus. He is our source of life. He is the source of all the fruit. He is the source of our power. And He is the source of love and the only source of salvation for us. And He is also the source of our friendship. He chose us. We are in the hands of the heavenly gardener who prunes us so that we can be more fruitful and mature in our walk. Welcome his pruning and follow his will, folks. I love you all. I miss you all. May God bless each and every one of you.